Thank you, Xander. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about something very important to me, um, and that is just uh, the target plant concept and how it is used to promote successful post-fire restoration. Um, so to give a little background, uh, let's see if I can get this going here. There it is. Uh, New Mexico State University has 12 experimental stations throughout the state. Uh, we are the only forestry research center located in Mora, New Mexico, uh, right here at the number eight. So for those who haven't been to visit, uh, we have a tour coming up uh, April 23rd and 24th. Um, so I would highly recommend coming out to visit uh, to see our facility. So uh, the research center itself, uh, we have three programs that we really focus on. Uh, operationally, we have our conservation seedling nursery production uh, program. Obviously we do research since it's in our title and uh, we focus on nursery systems, tree improvement, uh, forest restoration, international development. And uh, of course we are uh, a university, so education is very important to us. Uh, a little bit more about the Conservation Seedling Nursery. We are the largest uh, forest nursery in the Southwestern United States. Uh, we have an annual capacity of about 300,000 seedlings, um, which is actually a pretty small nursery uh, compared to other nurseries throughout the country. Uh, I would love to see this be a lot larger for our region, um, but we are the largest and, and we're doing, uh, I think, some pretty good things in terms of our production as well as the research. Uh, we grow over 30 different species, uh, primarily native species. I think we have like three or four non-natives that we do grow for windbreaks and other things. Uh, but our, our, our main species of interest are ponderous pine, duck fir, white fir, uh, Engelman spruce, pinyon, and aspen, some cottonwoods and willows. Uh, with regards to our research, um, our focus is in restoration via planting. So uh, the first area of, of interest is seed source. So this is really about selection and genetics, uh, collection uh, and, and seed processing. Uh, and then we move into our nursery systems. And so this is really about uh, irrigation, nutrients, lighting, and, and overall the, the growing environment that produces high quality seedlings for outplanting. And that leads into outplanting. So it's about sites collection, site preparation, uh, planting techniques, seasonal. So uh, after the fire, there's been, I, I've heard from land managers and some researchers about, uh, well, we don't need to plant, or I think we should be planting everything. And, and so the question is to plant or not to plant. And my quick answer is it depends. And, and it really is, it, I think it depends, and it should be based on the science that we have available to us. And so that's kind of what we're developing right now. But for this presentation today, I, I want to move forward and, and we're making the assumption that as a land manager or a researcher, you've made the decision to plant some areas uh, after the fire. So this is, that decision has been made and so how to be successful in that process. Uh, but I'd be glad to have discussions about the plant, no plant uh, at any time. So uh, some background, let's talk about natural regeneration after a fire. So um, what we have seen is when you look at low to moderate um, severity fires, uh, you see natural regeneration actually take off quite well. But in those high severity fires, those degraded landscapes, what we see in terms of soil, uh, we see a loss in organic matter, uh, structure and porosity, a loss in nutrients, uh, and increases in erosion. Uh, with regards to plants, the obvious is that we see a reduction in established plants. So that overstory material is just gone. Uh, we also see that the seed bank within the soil is also typically lost. Um, and then re related back to the established plants, we see decrease in seed dispersal. And that's really based upon uh, the burn area. So we have this fringe uh, versus interior. We know that we do get some pretty decent uh, regeneration along the fringe where there are seed sources available, but further inside, um, it just depends. And so I think that again, goes back to the plant, no plant. It just depends on um, the severity of the fire as well as the size of the fire. 
So what is going on in terms of planting efforts right now? Um, so the, the title of this slide is the restoration gap. And it's really based on a white paper produced by Jim Utes. Uh, I don't know if folks have actually seen this, but it's the 2016 reforestation strategy white paper. And it's based on uh, forest service land only region three. And what was uh, discussed in that white paper are the planting needs for uh, New Mexico and Arizona. So in fiscal year 2015, uh, based on high severity fires, the, the planting need was 118,000 acres. What was actually planted in that year was 2,500 acres. And then if we actually take uh, over a 20 year period, a yearly average, we have an additional 13,500 acres of high severity fires within region three that are added to that planting needs list potentially. And so if we were to do some rough numbers here, and, and these are rough and I'm not promoting to plant like this, but 300 trees per acre, that's 35 million seedlings that need to be planted with an additional 4 million seedlings per year based on um, that high severity fire, uh, fire on a yearly average. So what is happening in terms of planting success? So there's a lot of research out there that looks at natural regeneration after fires uh, and, and it's continuing and I think it's great work, but there's actually very few studies that have looked at planting efforts uh, after fires. There's a really good study that was done by Jess Utes, Tom Kolb and others uh, at a Northern Arizona University in 2015, where they looked at eight different uh, fires and compared natural regeneration to uh, planting. And what they found was um, that planting was actually more successful in promoting stocking levels than natural regeneration. However, one big problem was that of those planted seedlings, uh, average survival was only 25%. And this is kind of the basis of the talk. 25% is, is pretty, pretty low. That's a terrible return on investment. Um, and I think that we can do a lot better. I think somebody has their microphone on, just FYI. <laughs> Um, so that brings us to the uh, target plant concept. And so that is the basis for really our research and should be the basis for a lot of restoration efforts uh, for land managers. And the very quick definition of the target plant concept is fitness for purpose. Um, another definition would be plant quality may be defined as those attributes necessary uh, for a seedling to survive and grow after outplanting. Or another way to put it is matching the right seedling to the right site. And so uh, this strategy has eight elements. And I'm going to go through these pretty quick. I want to go through each one uh, because I think they're important. And they all connect to one another. And, and again, it is the basis for our research and should be for restoration efforts. Uh, the first one is a pretty obvious one. Um, it's just defining your objectives. And so are you doing something in reforestation, reclamation, restoration? And then drill down from there, be as detailed as possible about what you're trying to accomplish in terms of that restoration effort. The next is site evaluation. So here it's really to define the site in terms of soil characteristics, uh, climate, vegetation, uh, and other elements like slope, aspect, elevation, animal populations. And these will then give you an idea of what may be the limiting factors on that site. And some are pretty obvious. Uh, when we look at the abiotic uh, water in the Southwest is obviously uh, a major issue, but it could have some issues with soil. Uh, biotic, we've got soil, vegetation, animal pathogens. I know uh, with a lot of the, the research and uh, restoration programs that I'm involved with, uh, animal browse and activity um, is also a major limiting factor. So it's important to prioritize those limiting factors. And with that, um, you can then define your mitigating measures to help alleviate some of those limiting factors. So for example, let's say you're on a mine reclamation site and you know that the soil is pretty much uh, poor and that it's important to enhance nutrients or water holding capacity by adding organic matter. That's something that can be done. Probably not in the forest, but uh, kind of the direction for the whole target plant concept. 
Obviously, another great one is veg control. This can be done in the forest and is shown over and over and over again to be very effective in promoting both growth and survival of your outplanted uh, material. And then animal damage protection, again, is also proven to be uh, very important. So fencing, hunting, trapping, uh, some kind of physical barrier, ways to protect uh, your plant material from actually getting damaged by uh, any kind of animal. So the next element is genetics. And I've broken this into two parts. The first one is just species selection. And this is based on your objectives. So, you know, are you looking at uh, just trees or do you want to do some kind of combination of trees, shrubs and plants and or grasses and forbs? Um, and so you got multiple species. So it's really important to kind of have that set up within the objectives. Uh, genetic selection is really something we focus on with our research. And uh, it starts with the seed source. So what are you going to be using? Are you using a local source? Well, what is a local source? So uh, typically we have seed transfer guidelines that help define uh, where you can move seed before they're maladapted to whatever planting environment. Uh, in the Southwest, we really don't have those. Um, and what we actually are working on right now with uh, Mary Frances Mahalovich with the Forest Service is defining some seed tr uh, transfer guidelines for ponderosa pine. Um, another one is to make sure you improve the genetic diversity uh, by incorporating uh, more than just a single seed source, but uh, as many different seed sources as possible. And outside of what has been collected in the past, so maybe look at different ecotypes instead of that superior tree optimal site from which uh, most seeds are collected from. And then the last one is that, you know, it's possible to implement an assisted migration program um, through this genetic element. And so basically moving seed sources from southern latitudes to northern latitudes or from lower elevation to higher elevation. And I'll be discussing a lot of that in detail in a moment. Uh, plant material is another element. And this is really to talk about uh, the growing of, of the seedlings or whatever uh, plant material you're doing. So it could be just seed that's going straight out into the field. Uh, or you're looking at cuttings or, or seedlings. And the, and the stock type is really about how it's grown. So is it in a container or a bare nursery? What type of container? What size? Um, what does the seedling morphology look like? What is the root architecture that you're, you're trying to, um, to grow in that nursery? What is the root to shoot ratio? Um, and then lastly is conditioning. What can you do in the nursery that will change the physiology of the plant that will help it succeed in an outplanting environment. And I'll talk a lot more about that last one uh, when I get to some of my research examples. Uh, outplanting techniques. So, you know, this pertains to planting patterns. For example, uh, a grid system, which is pretty common uh, in the Northwest and a lot of other areas where commercial forestry is practiced, or a nucleation or a grouping strategy. Uh, another important piece are tools. You know, you can grow the best seedling um, and it is the right seedling for the right site and you use the wrong tool to put in the ground and you can have failure. So making sure that you match the right tool to um, that seeding and that site uh, can make or break your restoration effort. Uh, outplanting window. Uh, this one uh, may be obvious, but uh, there are a lot of folks that still plant at the wrong time. So the key is to focus on optimal soil moisture, temperatures, and wind speeds to minimize any kind of stresses for, um, for that seedling that will be outplanted. Right now we're targeting uh, monsoonal plantings and fall plantings, uh, but I, I think there's a lot of research that can still go into, uh, into this area. All this brought, is brought together with uh, monitoring. So the idea of the monitoring is to assess the performance and refine the process. So just kind of go through all eight elements and uh, make sure that they are working properly and if there's issues to go back and just refine that process. So that brings me to uh, the target plant concept and its applications in research. So today I'm gonna go through um, three examples. And uh, the first one is about seed source and microsites for ponderosa pine. Uh, the second one I'm going to talk about is aridity adaptation of ponderosa pine. 
And the last one is a drought conditioning study uh, looking at Aspen. And all of these are still uh, have preliminary results. So you'll see a kind of combination of what's going on, but we're, we're still gathering data and uh, hoping to finalize. Uh, actually, the number three is, is the one that's closest to being completed. So the first one is a uh, working title of Influence of Seed Source and Log Microsite on Ponderous Pine Restoration. And this is in collaboration with uh, Dr. Josh Sloan at Highlands University uh, here in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Uh, this study, the objective is to assess the effectiveness of planting seedlings using log microsites from southern seed sources of ponderosa pine to a northern latitude located in the Bias Caldera National Park. That seems like a lot. It is kind of a, a difficult objective, but uh, here's the study design. Hopefully it helps uh, explain it a bit more. It is a split plot factorial structure. Uh, so the whole plot are log treatments where we have uh, one treatment is where seedlings are planted on the north side of a log versus a control area where there are no logs. And then the subplot um, treatment is uh, six seed sources where we have two sources uh, from 33 degrees latitude. We have two sources from 34 degrees latitude and then two control sources from 35 degrees latitude where the bias caldera um, is located. So what does this look like? Well, on the right is a, a sample of one of the blocks. The, uh, the dark gray color is our log treatment. These logs are running in an east-west fashion, um, and then we plant it on the north side, and the light gray is a no log, and we see um, the different sources here. What does that look like on the ground? Uh, like nothing I've ever seen before, for sure. It's not something you wanna do operationally. Of course, this is a research project, so we do things a bit differently. Uh, but you can see the logs here and you can actually see a seedling right there. And here's a Google Earth view uh, of these logs and the no log spots. So some real quick basic results that we've got. Um, for source treatment, really cool findings so far is that we have our southern sources here. Uh, in 2017, this is ground line diameter in millimeters we see that the southern sources are significantly greater than that of our local sources. And in 2018, we don't have the full stats on them yet, but we see this same pattern holding true. We don't see any differences in survival for sources, but we do see it for growth. Uh, when we look at the log treatment, the reverse is true. We haven't seen anything yet related to growth, but survival, we do see a, a significant difference. Our control, we have 66.7% survival compared to the log at almost 75%. And this can be partly explained, and I think we all know where it's going, but to soil moisture. So this graph here shows in the blue uh, bars precipitation. So these are precip events. The yellow line or orange line, I'm colorblind, uh, is the control plot, and then the red is the log plot. And right here in this high precip event that occurred um, mid-July almost, in the monsoon season, we see this uptick in soil uh, moisture. And as a result, it sustained itself uh, all the way through October. Um, no surprise there, but definitely important. And goes back to the target plant concept about um, mitigating those limiting factors, which we know soil moisture would be. So this is a, a, a quick aside. I want to talk about uh, how southern sources differ from northern sources. And, and typically when you want to do uh, any kind of genetics, uh, provenance, common garden study, the more sources you have, the better. And I think typically a, a provenance test requires about 30 sources to do it right. That uh, Caldera study really only had six. So, it, you know, it's hard to tell what's happening. But we do have a study here at the research center in Mora, uh, it's a provenance test that was planted in 2012. We have 75 sources. Um, here's a map of these sources. About 65 of them occur uh, in the Southwest. So most in New Mexico, some in Arizona and Southern Colorado. And then we got some uh, outliers just for checks um, involved as well. 
And what I did, and, and actually this provenance test is the one that we are using uh, to define seed transfer guidelines for ponderous pine for the whole Southwest. Um, but I did a quick little assessment on, on diameter growth and height growth based on categorizing it, whether it's a southern source, a control or a local source or northern source. And I ranked them. So I didn't rank all 75 because that would take up too much of the screen, but the top 25. So here we have 61 down to 41. And what you can see right away is a majority of the 25 are southern sources. And here's our local source. When we look at the height, uh, we see a very similar pattern. We see this control sources coming in here. We still have a lot of work to do in terms of the uh, analyses that go into this, uh, but we're hoping to have something out um, by late summer. So I'm gonna move on to the next study. Um, again, a working title, uh, Aridity Adaptation Among Ponderosa Pine Populations. This is in collaboration with uh, Northern Arizona University with um, Tom Kolb and our PhD student, Alap Dixit. And uh, this is a study, common garden study, using 21 sources. So it's a lot more than what we have at the caldera. And these were selected to represent this gradient here. So here on um, the y-axis, we have elevation. And over here, we have mean annual temperature. And you see uh, this temperature elevation gradient. And we took all 21 sources and planted them in three uh, garden sites. We have our hot, uh, hot garden, our core garden or control, and our cold edge garden. This is the cold site. It is located um, just outside of Cedar City, Utah. It has a mean annual temperature of 4.9 C and precip of 685 millimeters per year. And what we found is we have, as of September, 95% survival. So we just planted these uh, late July of 2018, so we'll be getting our first full measurements uh, this upcoming fall. The control site is located just outside of Flagstaff at the Arboretum. Uh, you can see it right here. You can see actually the individual plantings uh, that we did. Uh, it is a bit warmer and a bit drier, 7.6 C and 556 millimeters. Uh, but so far, again, we have 95% uh, survival as of September. And then we move on to the hot site. Uh, definitely a lot warmer and a lot drier. Uh, this is about an hour north of Flagstaff. It's a little bit lower in elevation. You can see the juniper pinyon in the background. Sadly, uh, we lost everything at this site. So we have 0% survival. Uh, what happened there was we thought we were catching the upswing of the monsoon, so we planted right here uh, at the end of July, and then we have 45 days basically of no precip, and, and then we finally got that monsoon uh, rain event. But we lost everything. However, we lost it in a very interesting way. So um, what we did was we categorized the seed sources based on uh, elevation. So we have a cold seed source, the core and the hot based on these elevation uh, categories. And what we found was that we had longer survival for the lower elevation sources. So no surprise there, but uh, pretty ex uh, exciting finding and uh, something that we're gonna continue to uh, dig into the data um, a bit more. So the last study I wanna talk about, and it's probably the one that we have the most data on at this point, is the drought conditioning study. Um, this is in collaboration with Dr. Jeremy Pinto with the Forest Service, uh, again with Josh Sloan at Highlands and of course myself. So a uh, real quick background is that we're looking at three seed sources. So that's the genetic component tied to the target plant concept and then the plant material uh, of the target plant concept. And we're conditioning our seedlings. And I'll explain what that means in just a moment. Uh, but first, I want to give you a little background on what happens in nurseries for those that are not familiar. So current and historical nursery practices basically grow um, seedlings under optimal conditions. So we're looking at optimal light, irrigation, fertilization to maximize their potential. Uh, however, those optimal nursery uh, environments 
don't match that of the harsh planting environments on these degraded landscapes, such as a post-fire environment. And that's in terms of plant physiology, morphology, anatomy, and, and hydraulics. So uh, what do I mean by drought conditioning? So for this study, it means to intentionally limit irrigation during the initial growth phase in the nursery. Um, and the objective is to determine if conditioning alters plant physiology, morphology, and hydraulics that promote vigor and survival in the field. So this is actually being accomplished in three phases. Uh, the nursery phase, the simulated outplanting phase, and then another true outplanting phase in the field. Um, the experimental design, we're looking at two species. We have aspen and ponderosupine. Uh, we're studying these separately. And for the purposes of this talk, and, and also because we have more data, I'm only going to be talking about the aspen today. It's a three by three factorial design. So we have three seed sources and three irrigation treatments. The reason why we have the seed sources in there is more of a check to the irrigation treatments to see if it does work across um, a range. And so these seed sources um, for the aspen come from uh, just outside of Taos, New Mexico. So we collected from about seven different uh, Dr. Simon Lenhauser. with the uh, University of Gabon Aspen coming for that. Um, the irrigation treatment was actually based on dry down weights using the ground method for the racks that we um, grew the seedlings in. And we used sub-irrigation as, as the method for irrigation because we knew that an overhead system is not a very uniform way for applying irrigation. So, um, and for those who don't know about sub-irrigation, come to the tour uh, in two weeks, I believe, and I will get give you guys uh, a little introduction to sub-irrigation. Uh, but the treatments were based on that dry down target of field capacity. And we got this low level based on a uh, just quick preliminary uh, pilot trial, if you will, on where we would see permanent wilting point for Aspen, which occurred around uh, in the low 60s for uh, the gravimetric method. So we didn't want it totally injure our seedlings, so we wanted to push them as far as we could. So this creates our structure for the irrigation treatment. Whoops. Uh, as for measurements, I, I think we measured just about everything under the sun. So in terms of morphology, height, caliper, uh, leaf area, uh, we looked at root structure, we looked at biomass. In terms of physiology, uh, we are currently getting data back on carbon isotope. Uh, we have photosynthetic rates, and we are also looking at non-structural carbohydrates in terms of sugars and starches within the different plant organs. We also used a microscope to assess uh, both xylem and uh, stomatal characteristics. Uh, with regards to the xylem, we were really interested in the hydraulically active xylem vessels in aspen and tracheids uh, in the pine. And we use a staining or a dye method to do this. And you can see this here on the right. This is an aspen. And all of these blue circles are xylem vessels that are considered active. And these that are not stained are um, non-active uh, in terms of conducting water. With that same process, we were also able to measure xylem flow rate, so how fast the water was moving within uh, the plant. Uh, we were able to drill down a bit deeper and look at the xylem vessel diameters because diameter uh, size is related to potential cavitation where you have, if you have smaller diameters, uh, you are less likely to cavitate under certain pressures. And then lastly, we did look at stomatal density. This is of a leaf, uh, an aspen leaf, and you can see uh, the stoma right here, and there's a bunch of them. Uh, it was a bit surprising how many were there uh, in aspen. So some, uh, again, these are all preliminary results, uh, but we're gonna go through the, the phases that I talked about before. So this is the nursery phase result. One really important thing to point out is that we found for most response variables, no interaction. And, and I'm gonna come back to that later, but um, we found no interaction. 
So because we didn't find interaction and also it's hard to describe what's happening when you only have three seed sources and I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, uh, I'm really just going to focus on the irrigation treatments here. And so with the irrigation treatments, this is high irrigation, low irrigation, we see no difference in diameter. This same trend is true with all biomass that we found. So with leaf biomass, stem, and root, we saw no differences, uh, which was kind of surprising. We thought that maybe with the low, we would see uh, a bit of a reduction. Xylem flow rate, again, is how fast that water is moving uh, or sap through, uh, through the xylem structure. And this was done through the dye method. We see a significant increase in flow rate compared to the high and moderate. Now let's talk about active xylem. So again, this is the percentage of the total xylem that is conductive. And we see that the low treatment is significantly greater than that of the high. And here we have the control or high irrigation uh, with the, the staining. And here we have the low. So you can see a major difference between uh, those two treatments. Vessel diameter. Now, one hypothesis that we had in the beginning was that we would see smaller diameters with the low treatment. However, we really don't see any difference at all. Um, so that was a bit surprising and maybe uh, irrigation doesn't play the role in genetics and the G times E is a, a bit more powerful in determining that. Um, others may argue something different. I'd like to hear that for sure. Um, moving on to the simulated outplanting phase, preliminary results. So this is basically taking that nursery design, that three by three factorial of seed source and irrigation, and we added an additional one, uh, drought. So basically we took half of those and subjected uh, one half to a control where they were well irrigated throughout the whole growing season and the other ones were brought to field capacity and allowed to dry down to mortality. Um, Again, these are very preliminary results, and I do just want to focus on irrigation at the moment. Uh, this is diameter. Uh, the scale on this is a bit skewed, but I will come back to the reason why I did this. But we see this trend of increasing diameter um, from high to low. Um, so we definitely, I, I will uh, bring this to your attention that I'll talk about this in the actual outplanting phase um, soon. But one really cool finding is when we look at the hydraulically active xylem uh, in year two. And what we found was, um, so basically this material right here is your first year xylem. So this is what was put on during that nursery phase, and this is what was put out in the uh, uh, simulated outplanting um, phase. And the high, we had overall a very low amount of hydraulically active xylem, but most of it was occurring in that first year xylem. Uh, the moderate kind of follow the same trend, but overall uh, it increased the amount. And then the low uh, was by far uh, greater than the high. We still need to run the full stats on this. But interestingly, it was more balanced between the two. And so it even looks like that the uh, second year's island was more active than the first year's island. So the field phase, this is where the rubber hits the road, basically. You know, what are we doing and how does it work in a field? And what we wanted to do was really stress these trees and see how they perform. So we went to a mine site uh, just north of Trace Piedras in a place called No Agua. So we figured No Agua probably was pretty stressful. Uh, but the idea was to subject them to high levels of stress. Again, these are preliminary results um, and we did not find any interactions uh, at this point in time. Uh, here's a photo of the mine site. It is primarily overburden and waste rock. It's a perlite mine. So what you're seeing here is some of the perlite ore. Um, very little uh, organic matter in the soil and water holding capacity. And here you can see some of the aspens uh, in the foreground. So some results. Uh, what we're seeing for height is a significant trend where uh, with the decreasing uh, irrigation levels from the nursery, we see increases in height. We also see that same pattern with diameter, which brings us back to that simulated outplanting result that I was showing you before. That pattern uh, that we saw and, and the simulated outplanting is actually showing up in the field and is significant as well. Uh, but I think one of the very cool 
uh, findings that we have so far is survival. So as of August 2017, uh, across all the treatments, we had about 94 to 97% survival. Uh, as of August 2018, we see a major change and with the high at 78% survival uh, and the low at 88% survival. So we do see a, uh, an increase in survival with that lower irrigation treatment. And I expect when we collect our data this, this uh, August that we will see a, a bigger separation among the treatments. So some quick take home messages about the drought conditioning study. Um, that absence of interaction is very important because it's basically saying that the irrigation treatment responses are not likely to be influenced by genetics, at least the genetics that we were working with. But I think there needs to be more research on this uh, to tease that out a bit more. Uh, we also showed the ability to alter seedling characteristics through that conditioning. Um, and this translates to increased performance in the field. So uh, we're pretty excited with the results so far. Uh, a lot of nurseries, I've given this talk to other nurseries in Oregon, Idaho, um, and they are looking at potentially changing some of their irrigation regimes in their nursery uh, slowly to test it out first um, based on what our findings are uh, with this. Uh, some future research directions. This is my last slide, but I want to talk about what we're planning to be doing or currently kind of involved with. Um, we have a drought conditioning 2.0 study. It's actually with Tom Kolb and we are taking 10 sources and doing a high low uh, irrigation treatment and out planting back in that uh, blue shoot site where the hot site uh, had complete failure um, at, so that we can actually get a better understanding of what's happening uh, with the genetics and potentially see how our drought conditioning um, irrigation treatment works. Uh, we have a proposal out, it's a CREST proposal, uh, where we want to do a study looking at, at the nucleation planting strategy. And the idea behind this is that um, the idea is restoration basically should not be across the entire landscape that has been uh, degraded from a fire or something else. Uh, there are ways to do this where you can create tree islands and emphasize a lot more input when you have limited resources to begin with so that you can have success. It emulates natural regeneration patterns um, and basically allows for um, a, a future forest condition that is what would be considered um, in, on par for that groupy clumpy that's defined in the um, GTR 310. Um, another study that's currently going on right now, it's with Bandelier um, National Monument, and it's our ecotype based seed source selection. Um, right now, most seed that are in storage and that are being used for production are based on commercial values. So they go to um, mother trees, seed sources that are on optimal sites, and these are the dominant trees on those optimal sites. So these are the superior trees. And we're suggesting not to take that out of the mix, but to incorporate dominant trees from fringe sites, from those more harsh sites that have restorative value, not necessarily commercial value. But we need to do a lot of testing on this before um, we put it into practice. And one last piece, we can't do anything, whether it's you know, actually doing management of reforestation or the research without seed collection. And I know that um, that is quite limiting everywhere. We have the largest seed bank uh, in the Southwest and it's, it's pretty small. So uh, I think that's something that we should always be promoting. Anyway, uh, I wanna thank you guys. I'm gonna um, open up this to any questions that you may have. I'm not sure how this will work with the webinar. So maybe Xander will, will chime in on that. Yeah, sure. I sure will. Uh, first of all, great photo there. Um, second of all, thank you for a, a, a great presentation. You covered a lot of ground and you did it um, in a clear yet quick enough way to keep us all on board. So thank you. Um, a couple of questions uh, came up in the chat window. Um, maybe an easy one first. Uh, Lisa Bai asked about finding out more about future trips to Mora. I assume she means the research station and not uh, uh, just uh, touring around Mora. 
Um, so do you want to give details on the uh, 23rd, 24th event? Well, you probably have better details, but I think the 23rd, we're meeting in Hemes Springs and we're basically visiting the Los Conscious Fire. Uh, I don't have that agenda in front of me. Uh, and then the 24th, uh, we are coming here and, and basically we're going to talk about uh, the nursery environment and kind of the operational side. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, research that was presented today. In fact, we have the seedlings in that drop conditioning 2.0 growing right now, uh, and everybody will get to see them. So it's going to be pretty cool for folks to see that uh, in action. Uh, we're going to go up and visit that provenance test that has um, the 75 sources of ponderous pine. And we also have a um, southwestern white pine gene conservation orchard where uh, the idea is that we have some blister rust uh, resistant um, sources that we have grafted and created an orchard. So, you know, there's some good discussion, I'm sure, that can come out of that. And then this fall, you're planning, uh, maybe the, the details are a little bit um, less clear, but um, you're planning a sort of a day for the public uh, at the research station as well, right? Correct. So, you know, it's still tentative, um, but the idea for the 14th of September is it's for the public. So, I mean, researchers and land managers can definitely come, but here it's about the whole restoration effort that we're trying to do here in New Mexico. So it wouldn't be just me, but it's the Highlands uh, University Forestry Program. So the educational element, uh, Kent Reed's group uh, with the Forest uh, Watershed Restoration Institute. Um, it, the whole group is basically trying to talk about uh, the current state of forests and some future directions that we want to take uh, to educate the public. We would love to get, um, you know, congressmen and women out here as well um, so that, you know, we can get more uh, funding moving our direction to do the right thing. I think we all know that resources are limited everywhere. Yep. Great. And so, um, uh, Lisa or anybody else, if you want more info on that, you can um, put another message in the, the chat window or contact me directly, um, kind of talk about some of the details of some of those field events. Let's dive back into kind of the nuts and bolts of the, some of the science here. Um, let's see. Well, actually, this is, this is a little bit of a, not really the science, but the uh, reforestation strategy you mentioned um, that Jim Utes had uh, prepared for the Forest Service. Oh, and do you know, is, is there a public version of that? I, I, I think last time I heard that was sort of an internal document, it, but I didn't know whether... I don't know. I, actually, it's a good question. I mean, he definitely shared it with me, so I apologize if it's not supposed to be public. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, he does know that I've been talking about this, and so I, you know... I think all is good with him, you know, presenting this, this data in terms of getting that document, uh, we would need to talk to Jim. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, for anybody who doesn't happen to know Jim on this call, um, Jim Utes is the region three silviculturist for the U S forest service. And, um, I think an email to him would be probably the best way if you felt like you really needed that reforestation assessment. Um, and then uh, let's see, so uh, Willie Begay asked a question about um, uh, invasive species, uh, novel non-natives that have been introduced. And um, I don't know, Owen, if you wanna, I know it's a, like not focused at today's presentation, but clearly relevant to some areas where we think about reforestation. Do you have a comment that you can share on that topic? Um, okay, well, yeah, not knowing more detail, and, and if she wants to chime in um, a bit more to explain, but uh, first off, I think that if you can get um, your native species established, it can, it, 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 by controlling vegetation within, let's say, these nucleation plantings, um, you can get better control of the site. And we're seeing that over and over again uh, in different locations not just here in the Southwest, but just, you know, anywhere throughout the world where we have exotic uh, invasive species moving in and we are trying to restore it back to some kind of native system. 
um, the best thing to do is veg control. Um, and herbicide use um, is commonly practiced in a lot of places. It's not very commonly practiced here in the Southwest, but um, I would argue through what I've seen, I would say that mechanical means are probably going to be a good start, um, but they are a bit more expensive than chemical means. So, you know, I don't want to say that there's just one tool uh, in the toolbox to make it work, but regardless, uh, there's a ton of literature that, you know, if you want to get control of any kind of invasive species, the best thing to do is just go after it. Um, and, and you have to do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and then once you get your plants established, uh, especially those that are fast growing and can shade it out, uh, potentially you can even have better control uh, just through those means uh, and not really need to worry about uh, going in with chemicals or mechanical means. Great, thank you. Um, uh, another question um, that came up, uh, just sort of a, a little nuance on the planting site, the, the mine uh, reclamation site where you mentioned there was a perlite content. Tim was asking about the perlite having a low water holding capacity. Uh, so perlite, most people are familiar with perlite in the horticultural sense, and that's expanded perlite. So basically the ore is a dense material, and then they take it and they heat it up and it pops up like popcorn. And so okay. uh, two totally different elements completely. So what's there uh, is the ore, what is in horticultural practices and what goes into drywall and all that is expanded perlite. So it's, that's the primary product is the ore. So it, it's not, they're not connected. So okay. it's basically a rock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good, good little detail there. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, Willie asks about the transportation of seedlings. Um, and obviously that's a kind of key step in it all. Do you want to um, make, uh, make a comment about that? That, that is, uh, I really appreciate that comment. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> so there's a, uh, there's a, a researcher with the Forest Service who retired, uh, wow, maybe five years ago, Tom Landis. He's an amazing researcher. He's based in Medford, Oregon. But he had a really good analogy is that basically seedlings, when they come out of the nursery right at the very end, it's like having $100 in your bank account. And everything you do after that is a withdrawal from that bank account in terms of the carbohydrates in reserve that help give it enough um, protection so that when you get to go to outplanting, <clears throat> that they will survive and grow. So you can do a lot of bad things to those seedlings. So you can just throw seedlings in the back of a truck, open in the wind, drive them down the highway when it's 100 degrees outside and you're gonna have a major problem. Um, and so that would take out $50 from that bank account, if you will. So the idea is to minimize uh, those deductions, uh, and a lot of folks actually use reefer trucks or refrigerated trucks for transporting. In fact, we are building our refrigerated trailers so that we can transport seedlings uh, to research sites because we do not want to impede. Um, we know those seedlings are going to be stressed. We don't need to do anything else to stress them out. So transportation uh, is a key component to the whole picture. And a lot of people forget about it. Um, and it, it doesn't just stop there. It's okay once you get to the site, you don't wanna just throw seedlings out in the open in the sun. Uh, we have a, a sheltered tent. Uh, we actually bring water and we can irrigate seedlings. Uh, we do not want to have any more deductions than necessary. That makes sense. Um, I think that's good to highlight that. And uh, we're coming up at the top of the hour. I don't see other um, questions in the chat window. So I think it's probably a good time to wrap up. And Owen, I want to thank you again for a great presentation. And uh, to all our participants, I hope you can join us on future webinars, uh, such as Jen Stevens, um, and I think that's the third of May, um, kind of building on this question of, of planting and reforestation. And so with that, I'll, I'll close off the webinar, but thank you everybody very much. Thanks everybody.